Well, uh, thanks very much, Melissa, for the introduction, and my thanks to Deb for organizing this session, and my thanks to Carol and Jennifer and Matthias for agreeing to participate in the discussion. Uh, I should say I, I grew up just down the road in Wellesley and went to college a little further down the road at Holy Cross, so it feels like a kind of homecoming to be here today, and it's, it's nice to be back home, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Uh, in the book that provides the occasion for this workshop, as you can see, it's a mini book, really, but, but it's cheap. You know, so, um, in the book that provides the occasion for this workshop, uh, I offer an argument as to why we should grant amnesty to irregular migrants. And when I say we, I mean the United States, for I'm still an American citizen, even though I live in Canada, where I'm also a citizen, and also liberal democratic states in Europe. I think the argument applies to them as well. Uh, I embrace the term amnesty, as you will note, uh, though I prefer the term irregular migrants to the more common term illegal immigrants for reasons we can discuss later if you want. Now, in arguing for amnesty, I'm not going to challenge the conventional view that the state has the right to decide whom it will admit and the right to apprehend and deport migrants who settle without authorization. Uh, there are reasons to question that assumption, but it's the one that most people hold. And so for the purposes of this discussion today, I just want to accept it as a premise. Even with that premise, I think, states are sometimes morally obliged to grant legal resident status to irregular migrants, and I want to explain why. So let me start with a claim, an example of a claim for amnesty that I suspect most of you will accept, and this is the case of Margaret Grimmond. This is a true story, by the way. So Grimmond was born in the United States. She moved to Scotland with her mother as a young child at age four or so, and a few years ago, at the age of 80, she left the UK for the first time to go on a family vacation to Australia using her newly acquired American passport. When she got back to Britain, the immigration officials at the airport told her that, well, she was not legally entitled to stay. She had four weeks to leave the country. She was, in effect, identified as someone who had been an irregular migrant for the 70 plus years that she had lived in Britain, since she had never established a legal right to reside there. And, and, of course, she clearly knew she was not a British citizen since she had acquired an American passport for her trip. So the immigration officials were saying, in effect, send her back home, putting into practice the rhetoric that one hears in Britain and the United States and many other places about what are often called illegal immigrants. Well, you will be relieved and happy to hear that Granny Grimmond was not deported. Once the story appeared in the newspapers, the moral absurdity of forcing this elderly woman to leave a place where she had lived most of her life was evident to the public, and eventually to state officials as well, whatever the legal technicalities. Even if Grimmond had been an irregular migrant all those years, that clearly no longer mattered. So, but think about that case. Grimmond, I'm saying, had a moral claim, a moral claim to stay in Britain, and that claim was especially strong for three reasons. She had arrived at a young age, she had immediate family members in Britain, and she'd been there for a long time. And each of these elements is worth considering separately. So first, the fact that Grimmon arrived as a child meant she was not responsible for the decision to settle in the, in the United Kingdom. Almost all young children, where you live for, for all young children, is, is a product of your parents' choice, not of your own choice. And that's important because people often insist that irregular migrants deserve to be deported because they have knowingly violated the law. Well, you can't really say that about children. They can't be held responsible for violating immigration laws. But it matters where they live. In Grimmon's case, being raised in the United Kingdom made her a member of British society, regardless of her legal status. And it's the same with all children. The years of childhood are the most important from a society's perspective, the formative years of education and wider socialization. And it's just morally wrong to force someone to leave the place where she has been raised, where she's received her social formation, where she has her most important human connections, just because her parents brought her there without official authorization. Human beings who have been raised in a democratic society become members of that society, and not recognizing their social membership is cruel and unjust. And current legal rules in North America and in Europe threaten many young people in just this way. Some of you may be familiar with the story of the young man at Harvard who, who, uh, that was in the newspaper a few months ago. Uh, I've forgotten his name, but he was brought from Mexico to Texas as a small child by his uh, mother, raised by a poor single mom. He went to school, he worked hard, he did well, won a scholarship to Harvard. Classic American dream story. 
And then on a trip home to see his mother, his immigration status was detected. He was detained and threatened with deportation. Well, fortunately, that deportation order has been put on hold, and it seems as though he'll gain legal status, thanks in no small part to the support that he received from people in the Cambridge area. Well, but granting legal status to children like him should be our normal policy, not a lucky exception for those who happen to get the support of a powerful community. And in fact, there is a proposal before Congress, it's called the DREAM Act, that would do just that. And I must say I'm bewildered as to why anybody would oppose that. Well, now, the, the principle that irregular status becomes irrelevant over time is, is clearest for those who arrive as young children. But I, I think it applies to adults as well, especially when they have close family connections to citizens or residents, as Grimmond also did. So take another case, the case of Miguel Sanchez. Again, this is a true story, but in this case, I've changed some of the identifying details. So Miguel Sanchez could not earn enough to pay the bills in his hometown. He tried for several years to obtain a visa to come to the United States. He was rejected every time. So in 2000, he entered on foot. He made his way to Chicago, where he had relatives and friends, and he started working in construction, sending money home to his father. He worked weekends at Dunkin' Donuts. He went to school in the evening to learn English. In 2002, he met an American-born US citizen who lived in his neighborhood. They married in 2003. They now have a six-year-old son. Sanchez, his wife and son, live under constant fear of his deportation. Driving to the funeral of a relative in another city causes high stress because a traffic stop or an accident can lead to his deportation. Nor can they travel by plane. Their son has never met his grandparents in Mexico. But meanwhile, they live an ordinary life in the neighborhood. They have friends, they own a home, they pay taxes, their child attends preschool. They become friends with other parents. So the, 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 he's an American. It's an American family. But under current US law, there's no feasible path to regular, regularize his status. And there should be. Living with one's family is a fundamental human interest. The, the right to family life is recognized as a basic human right in European human rights legislation. And concern for family values has played a central role in American political rhetoric in recent decades. All liberal democratic states recognize the principle of family reunification, that is to say that citizens and legal residents should normally be able to have their foreign spouses and minor children join them. And that usually takes priority over the normal discretionary power that states get to exercise over immigration, but not when it comes to those who have settled without authorization. And it used to be possible to, to at least gain exemptions from the normal immigration restrictions when people married Americans, but that's no longer the case. This is wrong. Once someone has married an American citizen or resident, her ties to the United States, her interest in living here, and her spouse's interest in having her live here, all assume a new importance. And they greatly outweigh any interest the state has in deporting a person in order to enforce its immigration laws. So even if you think, as I'm uh, assuming here, that the state is entitled to enforce its immigration laws, it's not right to do so without regard for the harm that is done by deportation. If an irregular migrant marries a citizen or a legal permanent resident, he or she should no longer be subject to deportation. Miguel Sanchez should have a legal right to stay. Now, the final element in Grimmins' case, the sheer length of time she had lived in the UK, is also powerful. I noted earlier that Grimmin had arrived as a child. But suppose she'd arrived in Britain at 20 rather than four. Would anyone really think that this difference would make it acceptable to deport her uh, 60 years later? Grimmins' case clearly illustrates that there's some period of time beyond which it's unreasonable to deport people who have settled without legal authorization. Uh, but how long is too long? Well, what if Grimmins had been 60 and not 80? Would that have diminished her claim to stay? I, I assume not. Well, what if she'd been 40? Well, the poignancy of the case certainly diminishes, but the underlying principle remains. There's something deeply wrong in forcing people to leave a place where they've lived for a long time. Most people form the deepest human connections where they live. It becomes home. Now, even if someone has arrived only as an adult, it seems cruel and inhumane to uproot a person who has spent 15 or 20 years as a contributing member of society in the name of enforcing immigration restrictions. The harm is entirely out of proportion to whatever wrong is caused by illegal entry. 